Dude, we're moving. And I have a foot on brakes. What the heck? Dude, oh, no, we're it's not. right okay. here. Do we have to back up? We have to back up. We can't. a year of weather extremes. After an April full of tornado outbreaks, including the biggest super outbreak since 1974 in the last week, just one month later, another tornado outbreak would manifest and it would produce 244 tornadoes, including two EF5s, killing more than 180 and injuring more than 1,600. In this video, we cover one of those EF5s, one that would be overshadowed by the Joplin tornado two days earlier. The El Reno tornado of 2011 not to be confused with the 2013 El Reno tornado. This tornado is forgotten despite its EF5 rating and estimated wind speeds of over 210 miles per hour. In this video, we dive into the meteorological setup, tornado, and its aftermath, and the aftermath from the outbreak as a whole. After a shocking April full of tornado outbreaks, May was very quiet in the first three weeks, with only 72 tornadoes being confirmed. This is extremely low, considering May is normally the most active month for tornadoes in the U.S. However, this pattern changed abruptly, as a small low-pressure area associated dry line and cold front tracked eastward. On May 21st, a small system of thunderstorms developed in Brown County, Kansas, while another system formed to the southeast of Emporia, Kansas. The system in Brown County spawned a brief tornado over Topeka, Kansas, causing minor damage. This system also caused significant damage in Oskaloosa, Kansas, and other communities. Meanwhile, the system that formed in Emporia spawned an EF3 tornado that struck Reading, Kansas. One person was killed, several others were injured, and at least 20 houses were destroyed. These two systems developed several other tornadoes throughout the evening, majority being weak. A moderate risk of severe weather was issued for much of the Midwest, as well further south to Oklahoma for May 22nd. The first tornadic supercell developed in the mid-afternoon hours over the western Twin Cities in Minnesota and caused moderate damage in the Minneapolis area. Shortly after, an intense tornado crawled towards Harmony, Minnesota, prompting the National Weather Service to issue the first tornado emergency of the outbreak. Late that afternoon, a large, intense EF5 multi-vortex tornado left catastrophic destruction in Joplin, Missouri, causing 158 fatalities. It was the deadliest tornado since 1947, and it's the costliest tornado in history. Once again, a moderate risk of severe weather was issued on the 23rd, this time for the Southern Plains and the Lower Great Lakes. Forecasts showed that the main threats would be damaging winds and large hail, instead of frequent tornadoes, because the stationary front lacked the necessary wind shear to, to sustain the type of tornadic supercells seen on the 22nd. This prediction was bang on, as only scattered and mostly weak tornadoes were reported throughout the day. However, an EF2 tornado did cause significant damage in Tennessee and Kentucky. On May 24th, a high risk of severe weather was issued for parts of south-central Kansas, central and eastern Oklahoma, and extreme north-central Texas. A moderate risk was issued for the surrounding areas in those three states, plus northwestern Arkansas and southwestern Missouri. Throughout this region, strong to violent tornadoes were considered to be highly probable for three reasons. First, the stationary front was expected to maintain its position over the region. Second, wind shear was expected to greatly increase. And thirdly, these elements would be associated with the incoming trough. Late that morning, the tornado threat increased to 45%, a rare occurrence giving a flashback to many to the widespread April 27th outbreak. At 12.50 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the SPC issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for parts of south-central Oklahoma, a very rare occurrence, in effect until 10 p.m. In the late afternoon, a storm would develop and rapidly developed into a supercell. 
by the early evening, the tornado touched down about 5 p.m. and tracked northeast, rapidly intensifying. It reached EF5 status after about 10 miles on the ground. On Elm Street West, the tornado first EF5 indicator was present. The tornado caused ground scouring and debarked trees as it wobbled northeast. It reached its peak intensity in the first half of its life as it crossed Interstate 40. Three people were killed as two vehicles were thrown a kilometer from the interstate, and the victims were found a quarter mile away from their vehicles, stripped of their clothing and left unrecognizable. A 20,000-pound oil tanker that was parked near the interstate was tossed an entire mile. Several houses were completely swept away and ground scouring was severe. At the nearby Cactus 117 oil rig site, a 1.9 million pound oil derrick was blown over and rolled three times. Due to the extreme nature of the damage at Cactus 117 oil rig along I-40, damage in that area was rated EF5 and was the peak intensity of this tornado. The tornado weakened slightly as it passed north of El Reno and continued northeast, producing EF3 to EF4 damage in rural areas. The tornado then re-intensified and passed northwest of Piedmont as a high-end EF4, leveling multiple homes and causing additional fatalities. The Falcon Lake subdivision was particularly hard hit, and multiple homes and vehicles were swept into the lake. One home had nothing left but the foundation slab and an above-ground reinforced concrete shelter sustained damage to its metal door and outside from debris impacting it at extreme winds. An SUV was thrown three-quarters of a kilometer into a tree where it would be wrapped all the way around the tree like a bow. The tornado weakened to EF3 strength as it crossed into Kingfisher County, debarking trees and heavily damaging structures. The tornado then weakened further to an EF2 strength, with the damage confined to outbuildings and trees. Crossing into Logan County, south of Cassian, the tornado re-intensified ever so slightly, producing a mixture of EF2 to EF3 damage as a large high-tension tower was toppled and homes were destroyed. And two people who were caught outside during the tornado were killed. The tornado rapidly weakened, causing EF0 to EF1 damage along the north side of Gurthy before dissipating, leaving 9 dead, 181 injured, and a 63-mile damage path of destruction. The tornado outbreak would rage on until the 26th, producing more tornadoes, including three more EF4s. And with that, it was over. Several small towns were severely affected, and the city of Joplin, Missouri, was decimated. In retrospect, this is the most underrated tornado in my opinion. The El Reno tornado was overshadowed by the Joplin tornado just two days earlier. And rightfully so, I mean, the Joplin tornado was a lot more intense and caused way more destruction. And just two years later, the El Reno tornado of 2013 would touch down, the largest tornado in recorded history, and is argued to be the fastest wind speed on Earth. I don't really know what else to say, honestly, so I'll just uh, end it here. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If you enjoyed, consider subscribing, because it gives me motivations to make these and now I'm gonna go edit for a day. See ya. Oh someone's calling me. Okay. Subscribe to Storms Q this instant or else. Yeah, that's a very good point. You guys should do that.